think this is like amazing what you got going on. Your ideas, what you're bringing to the table here, um, exposure, you know what I mean? Like collective learning, like it's a really great like environment. And this I think can grow very large. And I think it's like probably gonna be a very like large initiative that you're starting right now. Um, and this is just literally the tip, like you said, and the tip is very exciting at this point. Okay. I feel. Um, it, 
it's uh, because of my combat training, I find that it's push, push, pull, push, and pull, push, and pull. Sometimes you have to take that push to get the pull you need to get into a better position. The nice thing is today, no one died. Yeah. <laughs> right. well, you, you, died you know how that <laughs> went. <laughs> right? And, I mean, isn't that what you do when you were doing that? Isn't that what life was all about? Yeah. Right. Nobody died today. I really realize, like, how influenced I can be. Like, yeah. I, I can be very, I can be very influential myself, but I can also be very influenced by others and other factors. Right. So I really, yeah, questioning and... Yeah, we, we all change our minds. Yeah. <laughs> For myself, uh, I do a lot of negotiating, so I think a lot about, like, game theory, and game theory is kind of like the thing where you assume the opposite side, uh, you have to assume that they're very intelligent, whether or not they act intelligent, whether or not they appear it, but deep down they actually are and you're making an educated choice based on what they see in their perspective. The other side of it is you also assume that the opposite side is always wanting to win. They have a set of rules, it's a game, no outcomes, why not win because it makes you feel good when you're winning over the opposite team. So when you're starting to think about that and look at uh, through assumptions of the other party and thinking where they're coming from and where they're going, you got sort of like this imagination of who you're against, when the reality is it was a bunch of people who cared about the other side and just wanted a nice even level outcome. But on other, our side, it was kind of like an intense negotiation, trying to get what was best for us. And even while we were going through, we were thinking, well, what if we were a little bit higher so at the end we could break even to make sure that the opposite side doesn't get greedy by us at least maintaining that by having a little bit more so we can even it out at the end. But in the end, we were doing more than we actually needed to to try and keep ourselves safe. Yeah. 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 Our <laughs> resident, uh, our resident <laughs> artist. <laughs> Take that one just because. <laughs> 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 Where's your card? I don't see your card. Well, I, I, I can't find it. You know what? You can always find it. You can always find it. I'm going to run for mayor. I'm, I'm going to run for mayor, so you'll always find it. There you go. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Don't forget, you guys can keep connecting with Meetup or, or the Facebook group. Please, I will. Right? We're going to keep, yeah. make sure everybody. I'm sorry about this. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed it. All right, take care, Don. Uh, preface this by saying this guy's quite amazing. Some of you may or may not have seen this, but uh, basically this guy posted this video and an explanation of how people behave in groups. And uh, it's uh, <laughs> his uh, discussion of, of what's happening here is very interesting. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be your first follower. You stand out and brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. 
and over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is of how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. <laughs> Who's seen this before? Anybody seen this before? Is that video specifically or set up? Well, this is this his original video. And he's, he does a TED talk as well, too, and he uses yeah. the video as a TED talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my world, we often say that the leader isn't the first person. The leader is the person who comes in second and supports the first person. What do you guys think makes, well, What's this all about? Cookies and community, right? So let's answer some questions. What, what do you guys think are the keystones of community? Words. Any words yeah, that people come to mind? People. people. So what would that be in a word? Mm -hmm. Helping. Cooperation. Cooperation. Okay. Relationships first, getting to know the other people. Okay. I think um, emotional bonds, not just intellectual. Would I would I be safe to say that empathy? Would yeah, be empathy word? but also just an ability to look at someone and and bonds and that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emotional. So my word is empathy. Your word is bonding. Um, I think they have similar meanings, but they can be different. Absolutely. I'm Accountability. Not Accountability. Okay. Integrity. Yeah. Usually people forming a community have a lot of stuff in common together. Okay. Now, no, there might be some differences, but usually so, a community has some sort of goal or so, purpose. So could I, right, so could I say co common I mean, belief? Market, yeah. I mean, we common can use belief, yeah. it's a commonality. Yeah, right? commonality. Yeah, commonality. Yeah, commonality. Yeah. Anything yeah. else? I don't think it's really just a belief, though, because usually you want to do something, right? Usually there's some What's goal. that? There's a word for that. A common goal. Okay. Commitment. What was the word that I used over there? Victoria, what was that word I used? Progressive? Okay. What did you say? <laughs> You're the one that said progressive. I said intention. Uh, intentional? Right. So I don't know. you have a goal. You have an intention to achieve that goal. But I'll say goal. I'll say intention. I feel like patience. Action. Patience. Some people are impatient. I would say that tolerance right. so and inclusivity are important values in my opinion. Yeah, tolerance, absolutely, and inclusive. Every community mm -hmm. needs Kevin's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about resourcefulness? <laughs> Resourceful? Yeah. yeah. You absolutely want that in a community, yes. Maybe different. Isn't that a different Diversity. Diversity? Honesty, I would say, but also the ability to. Like, well, what does honesty lead to? Mm -hmm. Honesty, well, there's integrity, trust. but there's also trust. Yeah. Okay, so I'll leave it at this for now. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of words that we know. We know these words. We know, right? It's that it's that six-year-old child going to his seven-year-old friend with that loaf of bread in, in an impoverished country saying, here, right? You know, they're, they're not, um, we trust each other. We're not walking up to somebody and they're going to steal our bread because we're offering them a bite, right? Um, these, are, these are all very important keystones of community. 
you know, um, one of one of the keystones also is a word that's being used more and more, and that is called non-aggression, an agreement to non-aggression, right? Which is basic, and that's the trust. I trust that somebody's not going to harm me intentionally. Excuse me, Trevor. Yes. You forgot something very important. Tell me about it. Proximity. Proximity. How can we deal with proximity when physicality is an issue? Well, proximity is, is when you and someone else share the same geographic location, for one thing. Or communication a channel? Of, a lot of, and a lot of the common thing, you use the same services, the same, uh, yeah. the same uh, buildings, the same, the same space. Sure. Sure. So it's really proximity. Sure, we can say proximity because I think that most people now see this not just as geographically mm -hmm. uh, well, most, constrained. Most communities are, I mean, even historically, we say, what about if we have online communities right True. now, and so True. it's like, again, that movement, yeah. uh, or whatever yeah. movement they're and yet, oh. you could be all around the world, right. but you're, you've got the same type of communication. Right. For but the problem is, is when you have a good, right, and our lives often revolve around goods, the materials for our buildings, the food on our plates, right? Those things generally tend to bring people to a geographically relevant proximity, right? And then you have the things that go up around that. When he talks about what was happening in Europe, uh, in the Ukraine and Poland, right? That also happened here too in Canada, right? Anybody have any idea why English is our, is, 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 was our first language and is now partnered with French, Francais, right? Why is English our primary language here? Was it really about the war? That's the question. That's a question that a lot of historians will ask and will debate at length Here's what I know in my community, and I also know that in Winnipeg here as well. When they went to markets, there was the Ukrainian, the Polish, the Scots, and nobody understands them. <laughs> uh, the Jewish, the Hebrew, right? The, the um, you know, we had Middle Eastern, we had Asians over here, right? We had the Spaniards, you know, the west, uh, the west of, the, of the old world, um, and what, how could they do business? So they started using a common language. And yes, the British were here and had established the colonies and said, well, why not English? But if they all, sorry, Sarah, uh, one second. If they both spoke Ukrainian, they would do business in Ukrainian. If they both spoke German, they would, they just, it's that commonality. But English has just become that common language that we do use to do business, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I suppose that's one explanation, but just based, I'm a Jewish person. Sure. Based on my knowledge of the history, reading the Shell, mm -hmm. and what, how people uh, did commerce, mm -hmm. the women did the trading, and they knew like six languages each. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a common language, but they still managed it. Correct, mm -hmm. and that's, and that's, but that's true, right? That is a truth, absolutely, is that often you had a member of a family who spoke a language that would work at the market that you were going to attend. And as you say, with the Yiddish women, I mean, it's like, okay, come along. <laughs> go. All languages. I mean, That's right. your husbands were studying Hebrew and Absolutely. The Torah all the time. That's right. They were the ones that went out and did the work. Mm -hmm. That's so right. The, the, the worldly work. Yes. So was it just the growth of the Western world that really propelled that? Yeah, it could have been. Any, at the end of the day, it could have been any language, right? It didn't have to be English. Yeah. It just was. It just became. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to get into that too, right? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it is an awesome colonize the world opportunity, right? Let's teach everybody English and let's all have them use U.S. American dollars, yeah. right? And if you think about it, like North America had an unreal amount of cultures mm -hmm. and people speaking languages, so it's like how can everybody really? But they did. And all the little trade routes. Mm -hmm. Which is true, but then everybody became closer together rather than farther. And the crazy thing about North America is 
even the indigenous population who did not have a North American common language somehow were able to do business with each other because they found a common language. They had a network. They had a network. Before English, before the colonists came for any of that, they had all of the, just go to Maritals Museum. Yeah. You can see yeah. the pictures of that. And that's North America. That also happened in Europe, pre-history, right? It definitely happened there as well, too. Um, just quickly go through our community here. I put my name up as a uh, community builder, right? But I serve a lot of different roles. I, I serve whoever I'm having a conversation with, depending on what their needs and wants are. Um, but uh, I'm gonna add that I also have some skills as a, uh, okay, let's say, uh, hmm, as a renovator, a home renovator. Sheila, hmm. any other skills you have other than, other than that? professional hugger, advertising stuff, <laughs> and water specialist? Uh, yeah, I'm into um, the holistic arts, so I have lots of different First and foremost, I'm a mom to the fourth greatest kids in the world. So that means you can cook. What's that? That means you cook. Oh yeah, I cook. I clean. Uh, I work. I. Uh, I want to get to know you better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kevin, you have Hello. here your physical uh, physical branding. Branding. So logos on everything. Right. Um, on top of it, I've been told I'm an incredible copywriter, where I can. Mm -hmm. Uh, write messages in a way that the majority of people can understand them. On top of it, I love creating and organizing community events, getting people together, uh, facilitating connections amongst each other, trying to make the world a better tomorrow. And then um, I'm writing a book with a bunch of other business owners that I got together to help educate people too. So I love education. Mark. You wrote them down your uh, what you do. Oh, my profession. Right. In what? Technology. Would you would Mark, would you be willing to share with the group here about Par IT? Well, the truth is that's not my main gig anymore. Okay. But let them I, know what this is a room of freelancers, I'm not one anymore. Either. Right. Uh, I joined one of the biggest employers in town actually. Oh did you? Yeah. Then that's cool. So what Mark <laughs> used to do, he used to be part of an organization called Par IT. I'm still part of it. And you are still a part of it. Yeah, it's just out of right. And uh, basically, it was a workers' cooperative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say successful. Mm -hmm. I love actually one of the biggest things we were failed to do was kind of scale scale beyond me. Yes, agreed. Like, mm -hmm. I did not, I didn't really That's a challenge, though. I didn't have the business skills to be into hiring and delegating. Yeah. I kind of learned it at, at the very end. That's and that's tough because a lot of times we get into things. A lot of small businesses get stuck in that. Right? Yeah. Uh, or operating mm -hmm. right everything and they can never scale the business. Yeah. When they're working on executive level, you've got people in the room are working on management level and you've got people doing the mm -hmm. work. There's, there's, in any organization, even in cooperatives, there, there is a, a certain trust, you know, that you do have to place in certain people, but all are people, right? Whether it's management, labor, the labor and the grunt workers front line, they have to trust that management is making good decisions, right? And uh, they also have to trust that the CEO is not going to screw them when it comes to who's getting paid and who's not getting paid, or how much. Um, yeah, I believe, I can remember, somebody please tell me on the internets, at the bottom of the video, the, which, which country it is. One of the countries, it's either Vietnam or Taiwan, they have a law that states that top executive cannot make more than seven times the lowest earner. That's, they can't make 13 times, they can't make 130 times. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, Lorraine, mm -hmm. you be next. You say that you're a writer and a social media creep. What else do you do? Um, I'm a first aid instructor and first responder, and I'm a single parent, so that kind of sums it up right there. I'm more yeah. resilient at doing that. Well, I'm having a child, you are the first responder, but you're mm -hmm. definitely going to be handy when the next group takes us out into the bush mm -hmm. and gets us all 
stuck in barbed wire. Yeah. All right. Find the Who's coming to the next one? I can build it too. <laughs> Jason, <coughs> personal <coughs> trainer, second degree jujitsu. Which which okay. dojo? Uh, CCSA. I started at Academy 64, went to CCSA. Cool. Um, under Silvio Barrett. Nice, nice. Did you ever do any Aikido? No. No? Uh, Muay Thai kickboxing as well. Okay. Cool. So what else What else can, do, do we know about your abilities and skills? Uh, I'm a teacher. Teacher? Yeah. What? I'm, I'm actually a certified instructor in Jiu Jitsu. Okay. So and teaching is a skill. It's not necessarily a knowledge base. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, who's next? Colin, tell us about yourself. Well, web marketing and DJ. Yeah, creative creative and uh, A-type personality. And uh, what else do we know about uh, Jason? He likes to wear salmon. <laughs> salmon. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, so I have a company. We, I don't know what else to tell you, what, what we do. I do, I guess there's a lot to it. There's a... Uh, Finding clients, um, figuring out what they might want, what would work for them, like giving them ideas. Uh, so I guess there's a lot of um, what do you call that? Uh, a lot of consulting that happens. Uh, conversation, communication. Lot of, yeah, a lot of conversation, figuring things out, figuring what what's going to work best, uh, what's the best price, can we get it for better prices? Shopping around for clients. Black, black. Yeah. <laughs> there's all kinds of there's all kinds of stuff that happens there, and then organizing the teams, you know. And, Victoria, you're next on this Price is Right show. Growth coach, mediator, <coughs> network marketeer. Yeah, I think I spoke that Marketer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> like specifically, I just realized that I'm really good at helping people uh, have more confidence in themselves. So like more, like more specifically, I have like a perspective taking coach so I feel like a lot of people hold themselves back from taking you know those next steps uh, whatever it is even like standing up to my own son like he's 16 like it's very difficult as a parent to um, just assert yourself in those situations when they're such a way um, so to actually like and actually be able to like just have everything kind of well rounded and wholesome, and you know, and I'll, you know what I mean. Like so, you're a more, rule keeper. Not really, just no. like just a, like I like to advocate for people, like more of a supporter. I'm like a professional supporter. You know what I mean? But just out of curiosity, and it's not a right or wrong answer by any means. As a growth coach, are you certified? I well, I have a conflict resolution degree. Okay. I'm a trained professional coach from Adler International, okay. and I'm a designated mediator. Cool. So you're designated mediator. Qualified. Excellent. Good for you. Yeah. Well done. So over yes. over educated. Yeah, okay. a little bit. It'll come in handy. It will come in but handy. But honestly, it set me on a great life trajectory. Absolutely. And it's taught me a lot because I learned nothing in my own years. So. <laughs> Don. Don. Don's gone. Don is a security and home automation. Personnel. He's an ADT dealer. Oh, cool. But he's also yeah. an expert. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Lisa, <coughs> instructor facilitator of what specifically, Lisa? Um, a lot of things. <laughs> um, I'm trained as a teacher, but I, I prefer the facilitation kind of aspect of that rather than really standing up to drill and kill kind of thing. So I'm, I'm very into. Um, personal relationships one on one. I really excel at that and getting to know people and um, finding finding their passions and their strengths and building on those. Um, Good skill to have as an instructor. Get yeah. to know who you're instructing and who you're facilitating yeah. for. Yeah. And I like to again um, kind of facilitate um, help facilitate for people who are not able to not able to um, what I want. Uh, advocate for themselves in whatever situations I've had, I've had sick parents for a number of years now, so I've learned a lot about advocating for other people and working within systems that are not perfect and um, what other skills especially as a teacher as well. Pardon? What other skills do you have? 
Um, I can raise flowers. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. um, what other skills do you have? Um, I'm great with animals. Cool. Yep. All right. <laughs> Please help me with your name. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom digital digital exhibition designer. Oh, cool. Trading. Yeah, it's two different things. So Show us about those. So the first one is exhibition designer. Uh, you know, the thing you like to do for. Um, so uh, so one of my main jobs is like you know the different kinds of human rights stories. Uh, My job is mostly uh, to uh, tell these stories in an engaging way using different kinds of technology uh, so that people, when they come to the museum, they're engaged by using the technology by the same time in history. Canadian history, special attention to Canadian history because it's Canadian museum, but also like different kinds of human uh, stories around the world. So I'm a technical person, I did engineering. So I, I like to do some analysis and technical nerdy geeky stuff. Do you cook? Yes, I do cook. <laughs> What's your specialty? My cooking is well, not anything. Okay. I is that the way it's cooking? Ah, yes, it is. You bet it is. Okay. We want to know you. Okay, I I when I cook, I'm very particular about what I eat. So uh, I I do my own. When you, when, you go to, when you bring food, people want to eat it. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I have enough, yeah. <laughs> oh, whether you're willing to share. Okay, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, journalist, and what else do you have? Theater. Theater <coughs> artist. Right, and public educator. So, um, do you want me to elaborate on any those, or? You can. I think those are great. So, but journalist in what, specifically? Well, my preferred media would be, like, audio or audio visual. Okay. I, I just prefer to talk than to write. Right. Um, I, I have written, um, I, I consider myself a <coughs> freelance journalist, maybe emerging freelance journalist in the world because I mean I haven't like made it with some big network. But on the other hand, I've actually um, done some work with just like local um, publications. Like for example, I worked with the University of Winnipeg paper as a reporter for like three weeks. And I just discovered that I didn't really like that lifestyle of having to go out and send the stories in a week write tons of words and I don't like writing enough. And I was always good at writing. You know, I, like, I, people are always telling me like you're such a great writer, but I love to talk. I don't love to write. And I don't like to be alone. I don't like to sit in front of the computer by myself and I don't have things to say, reading books and I don't like that. I'd make a terrible like, academic or scholar, even though my family always thought I should be that because my dad was very let's just say he was very introverted lawyer. So he had a certain vision for like my favorite thing in journalism is to just interview people um, about whatever. I've done quite a bit of that for CKUW. Um, you were on yeah, okay. a uh, bunch of that. And um, as far as the audiovisual stuff, Mike, I haven't done you know Mike Furnish then? Sorry? You know Mike Furnish. Mike Furnish? Mike no, Furnish? no. no. Mike, I work with, with Mike Welsh. Michael Welsh. Um, he's the main one I work with at CKUW. Right, right. Um, but I've also managed to get five. Um, published in CBC on their website. So those were written pieces, and they paid very well. Um, but for me, it's like I can't, as a writer, or as a creator of content, I used to want to be a content creator, but then I was in the position where I had to do that for a job, and I didn't enjoy it. It was just too much content, shoveling in too much stuff, too much stuff, too too quickly, too much, I like to think about things. Yeah, too much information, exactly. So like my favorite kinds of activities are like, there's lots of people around, and we're talking and visiting, and like, like I could do an impromptu speech like you would believe. Like, to give me a topic, to give me a few minutes, and I'm up there. And I was in, I was in um, Toastmasters for a year. I quit after a year because I thought, actually, it was, it was bad. I sort of rage quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because of, I thought I deserved to be <coughs> sometimes, and my impromptu was so good, and this is my first year in, in Toastmasters. And um, it's just like I love the energy of groups of people. 
that's probably why I went into the theater as well. Um, because again, that- It's good feedback in theater. It's yeah. immediate. Um, I don't want to make the force the world be better. It's not like that. It's more like I want to explore it on the level, uh, us all on the same level and us have, having a better time. I believe in the power of catharsis. It's very powerful. Mm -hmm. The ability to just feel and release pain. Sometimes I think we should have like once a year, we should have just, I, I would call it like hugging day. And we're all just going to hug each other. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I can keep going. For yeah. 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 Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Monique, what's it like being retired? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I've probably been retired since I was born. <laughs> <laughs> So what uh, what skill sets does Monique have? What does Monique, what 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 is when somebody needs something that Monique is good at? What are they coming to you for? Well, advice, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you knit? No. No. Do you mow lawns? Not if I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how to find someone to mow lawns? No, I just want to go until, I don't know. When the city comes in. 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 I'd like to have it paid, but it's too expensive. Um, okay, so. I know it's such a bad If anybody wants to know about money, just go see Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sarah. That's our journalist at work. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our next video. Oh, I'm sorry. Holy cow. Oh, your name's not on there. That's why you're doing that goalies. There is no role you can play. There is no role. Look at all that blank space. Yeah. Tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Jonathan Trapp. I work in manufacturing. I make sauna tubes. What is that? Sauna tubes. Where are those? tubes and saunas. Construction tubes. Like the ones that get cemented. Oh, okay. okay. Oh. Yeah, I do that full time. It's hard work, long hours, no pay. Uh, and then I have a side business where I work in direct sales, where I can, where I help people with services. Okay, good. Everybody, at the end of this, I want you to surround John. Learn more about him. <laughs> <laughs> Our next video, which is uh, about community building. <laughs> right now. From home improvement to fashion, one look at Pinterest and you'll see that this trend is here to stay. DIY is defined as the method of building, repairing, or modifying something without the direct aid of experts or professionals. But what if we took this concept and we applied it to our communities? What would that look like? I moved to Bismarck from, far, from Grand Forks five years ago and learned immediately that you will find what you're looking for. I remember calling a friend in Denver and complaining that there wasn't curbside recycling, they didn't have a food co-op, I thought the art and music scene was lacking a little bit, and she said, well, Heidi, if anybody's gonna change it, it's gonna be you. And that sounded exhausting to me, right? That sounded like a lot of work. But what I realized is I was finding exactly what I was looking for. Instead of looking for the right with this new community, I was looking for all of the wrong. Then something shifted. I started dreaming a little bit. I met some incredible people and started talking to them and found that they shared a similar vision. I found my tribe and we got to work. You see, DIY isn't necessarily about doing it yourself, but it's about finding those people who can offer some skills or expertise and help you along the way. So I just had to hold the vision and trust the process. I'd always been pretty health conscious and loved supporting my local food co-op here in Grand Forks as much as possible. I knew the, pos the positive impact that it could have on the local e economy, the small farmers in the region, and the health of my family as a whole. 
So I set out with this awesome group of people from Bismarck to create a food co-op there. Had I ever started a food co-op before? Absolutely not. Had I ever started any business before? No. Did I know how I was gonna go about working with these people to make it a reality? No, I really didn't. But that didn't matter, you see, because I showed up. I showed up to do the work and I found these incredible people to do it with me. And that's all that mattered. The first lesson I learned in this process was to trust yourself. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks changed the course of history with one word, no. Her action was spontaneous and not premeditated. And she later remarked, when I made that decision that day, I knew I had the strength of my ancestors behind me. That sentence gives me chills. What if more of us looked at life that way? with the powerful grounded conviction that we have the strength of our ancestors with us, of all of the groundwork that has already been laid out before us, and to trust that a path will unfold. Better yet, what if we worked so diligently towards something better that would benefit future generations, leaving things a little bit better than we found them? Trusting that process was a necessary step to making this vision a reality. The second lesson I learned in this process was to do it yourself. Not alone, of course, but not waiting for a perfect set of circumstances to act and to do something. To stop wishing and to start doing. Jason Roberts is an IT consultant and bike advocate living in the historic neighborhood of Oak Cliff, Dallas. He wanted to take a more active approach to revitalizing his neighborhood. And in 2010, Jason started the Build a Better Block project. He envisioned the transformation of a four block center in downtown Dallas using very little money, zero permanent infrastructure, and lots of creativity. They created temporary awnings, bike lanes, cafe tables, and made medians out of potted plants. They recruited local artists and food vendors to sell their goods inside and outside of abandoned storefronts. Knowing that the project could easily be shut down due to city regulations, they went rogue and threw caution to the wind. He said, we broke as many laws as possible. We were ready to go to jail for this. And no one really questions you when you put on an orange construction vest. I love it. You see, the beauty of the Better Block Project was that it altered the perception of what people thought was actually possible in that community. It showed them what could be changed through some creativity and determination. With the food co-op, we had a very limited marketing budget. We needed to reach a lot of people in a very short period of time. So we knew we had to be creative. As you can see there, that's one of our tomato bombs, and it's incredible what you can accomplish with some pickle buckets, some soil donated from a local farm, and tomatoes donated from a local nursery. We placed a sign within each tomato bomb that read, hi, I'm a tomato plant. You may see some of my siblings around town. We're here to spread the word about a local food co-op taking root in our community. If you see me, please water me, care for me, and watch me grow. And when my tomatoes are ready, enjoy them. We place them strategically around town at local businesses, popular restaurants, outside of TV stations, the governor's mansion, and downtown where we had extensive foot traffic. And suddenly the buzz had been created. We started receiving calls from the local media, memberships started rolling in, and people were posting pictures online of these tomato bombs that they had found outside the door, or of their doors. But ultimately, this was a test of community. Would people nurture this project like they would nurture these tomato plants? Because this was a community-owned co-op, right? It didn't belong to me or a board of directors. It was a cooperative-owned business that belonged to the members in the community. In order for our work to truly be authentic, we need to be ourselves. I was in a visioning session once when a woman slid me a piece of paper, and on it it said, you could get funded for some of this community work with a website scrolled underneath. <coughs> so I went to that website later that night and read in big bold letters, selecting leaders with creative solutions to tough community problems. And I immediately clicked away. A leader, I thought, that wasn't me. <coughs> Growing up, you know, a young girl in North Dakota, a leader was some guy in a suit, that wasn't me. But as I thought about the hundreds of hours that had already been poured into this project, I went back to that website the next day and applied for the two-year fellowship. I got a letter about a week later saying they were going to fly me to Minneapolis for a four-hour interview. Four hours. This is crazy. 
but I accepted because we must say yes to those things that scare us the most. So there I was in a hotel room in downtown St. Paul, leadership books spread across the bed because I was freaking out, right, nervous, I gotta read up on leadership. Um, but I realized that nothing in any of those books would prepare me for what I already had inside me, right? Sometimes leadership is just showing up and doing the work. In that moment, I turned on the radio to relax a little bit, and David Bowie's Just Dance came on, right? Like, he just, he was speaking to me at that moment. So I pushed those leadership books aside, and I danced. I chose to dance in that moment and not cram like a nerd for some test that didn't even exist because I recognized it was already within me. David Bowie, as you know, just died last month, and he was always marching to the beat of his own drum. He was called so many things, but one thing he never was was sorry, right? He was never apologetic for being himself, and neither was I. So I went into that interview the next day and was completely myself. I chose to be me instead of somebody who I thought they might want me to be. To me, DIY community building means being grounded enough in who you are and what you care about so that your ideas can take flight. It's not about having all of the answers, but finding those who can help you along the way. And it's not waiting for a perfect set of circumstances to act. It's about rolling up our sleeves and getting messy. Will you fail? Maybe. You might fall flat on your face, but what if you don't? What if you surprise yourself and you experience a tremendous success? That success, that is the ammo for the next successful do-it-yourself project. So let's work towards creating the kind of communities that we want to live in and be proud of. Let's say yes to those things that scare us a little bit. So today I'd like to leave you the way I leave each one of my children's yoga classes. You are enough. Everything you need is inside of you. You are a bright light. And the bright light in me bows to the bright light in you. Namaste. Thank you. Any takeaways from that? Um, well, it's interesting to me that the assumption was that a lot of people think they have to overstudy and don't think that they're enough to get into doing what they want to do and are surprised and depressed by this concept of leadership when it comes along. And I guess that's how some people are, but other people have a different approach to it, and I think it's a one person's point of view, right? But to me, the word leadership and the idea that somebody might believe in you is not really the be-all and end-all of making a better world. To me, that's maybe the, the beginning for, for some people, but I mean, when I was growing up, kids were mean to me. No one thought I'd be a leader of any sort. So I, I, I sort of bristle when I hear people say, oh, I was so accepted as a leader, and people, leader this, leader that, it kind of makes me mad. It's just from my perspective. Or at least a little annoyed. So, I mean, not super enraged, but annoyed. And I think that that's that's a really good perspective because when we put when we have these words on the board, right? So many so many communities, I find, they end up being co-opted, right? So what ends up happening is that we go and we join a group and we say, oh, this is going to be great, fantastic, woohoo, let's go, you know, change the world or make our lives better. And then suddenly you see direction changes. And then the next thing you know, it's not a community. You find out it's sponsored by means that they actually own the intellectual property for everything that you've been doing. And then the next thing you know, they're just constantly trying to sell you something. And then it's like, well, what the heck was I just doing, right? You know, so often, big, you know, the big buzzword these days, leadership, we're gonna teach you to be leaders, we're gonna teach you to be entrepreneurs. Can you tell me of any true entrepreneur out there who was taught to be an entrepreneur? Probably not. Right? You, yeah, you know, you, that's, that's the school of hard knocks, right? And the point isn't to be an entrepreneur, it's to make the world a better place because that's what you're about. Yeah. Being an entrepreneur is like what other people will say about you, and it, it sounds ego-fueled, it sounds narcissistic. Yeah. I don't think it's helpful. It's to tip the bear yeah. above everyone else. I don't like that. Yeah. Regardless of, Mark, regardless of your internalization of Par IT, I've always, right, and that's yours, okay, is I've always seen Par IT as a successful organization. 
that's how I view it. I don't know what your viewpoint is, and I'm you don't need to share that. Well, it's not okay? text, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's not text, right? it's, it's long, it's long as it's not But it sure long took long. a heck of a long time to get to a point, as you specifically stated, where you learned, where you said, ah, I learned some tricks along the way, you know? And that's what it takes. That's an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I know Mars and Passion to help the world be a better place. I'm really glad you came out, Mark. Yeah. Really good to see you. We do not have a civic life today. We have a civic life today. Yeah. Sorry, Matt. Take care. Oh, no, that one's someone else's. Okay. Um, take care, Sarah. <coughs> see you guys again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other takeaways from that before we move to our next one? Being yourself. Being yourself. Your authentic, you know, your authentic self. Your authentic self, right? You're cheating because you have the training, right? The heart, right? You sense it, right? You know, that's where our, that's where we come from. And, and it gets that bristle up, right? Like as soon as you, you're coming from the heart, you get that bristle in the neck. It's almost like an instinct right up in the, right at the back. It's, um, so many of us are in the red-black game. How do we negotiate that best game, right? Are we really worried about the other person who is also at the negotiating table, who actually was sitting there wearing a suit and tie, perhaps even gold cufflinks, but you didn't see the tatters on his shirt, right? And he's going home having lost the negotiation to no food on the table for the Right? The empathy. When we're talking about community, look out there. Where's the community? Well, we can find it. It does exist. But with so many other obstacles and challenges along the way, which are often trained, co-opted, enforced, institutionalized, we can't be our authentic self. Can't trust what the other person is going to do to us the moment we turn our back. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm pleased. Like I, I, I get that you guys probably figured out what I was hoping, what my intentions were with the red black game, you know. But then again, I'm going to pretend you had no idea and you simply chose black. And for that, again, I appreciate it. This is so much the tip of the iceberg. And I'm totally about experiential learning. So there's a, I want to do some more around community. I want to do some more around abundance thinking and behaviors and activities. And around relation, you know, experiences and relationships and, you know, a lot of the keystone words. So uh, we'll see how it plays out. Right now we're doing one event a month. Um, I believe that Kevin has one. The next one, well, I'll let him tell because if it doesn't change or what have you. Uh, I'm gonna just make sure that everybody is back. I don't think so. So that's one thing I'll just, because of my training, mm -hmm. okay, the way I've grown into it is, for me, I look at it as it's better to be a warrior in the garden than the gardener in a war. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my training now, especially too, when I'm learning stuff, mm -hmm. is focusing on self-defense, okay? And not the Hollywood crap that you see, okay? Stuff where my jiu-jitsu instructor is five foot seven, 135 pound woman, and she has no problem looking on my ass, okay? And I, what I, one of my goals is get more women involved seriously in these, this self-defense or there are so many predators out there now that will take advantage of any little situation and I don't think any woman should be in that situation ever. What is your dojo like? What is your rules around your dojo? Would you be able and willing to do or find a location to do a workshop? Yes. You can? Yes. Okay, then you and Kevin can have a conversation about that. That would be fantastic. Uh, little 
example is my sister's a nurse. She is a nurse out in Portugal, Mary. Lot of native population there. Uh, guy was strapped to a chair. Okay, hands are still free. Oh, this is the. I think I remember this one. And he lunged at her and grabbed her by the throat. Yeah. And actually had her his hands around her throat. Wow. The only thing that saved her life was the fact that she could stand up and move backwards. Okay. After that. She came to me and said, I need you to train me in self-defense. And I actually have a video of her the first time going through training with me. And there's quite a few things where she nearly broke my arm, she nearly broke my shoulder, uh, she put me on my ass very easily. And it's not stuff that takes a lot of strength. It doesn't take a lot of time to learn. It's just the repetitions of doing it over and over again. And one of the things that I find, you get, a, you get this big war out there in the world about the defensive arts and the assertive arts, right? A lot of the assertive arts, they are take your enemy down now and disable him, right? Whereas the jujitsu, the aikido, the, kara, uh, the, um, uh, the judo, yeah. right? They're defensive arts. And what they are is about is all, it's all about flowing away. Right? And being respectful of the enemy as you take it to the ground and control, control them, right? Um, yeah, right? And so, I mean, those, to me, those are, that's a huge respect for anybody who can do that, right? There is a time, there is a time and a place where you have to disable way more than you would ever have wanted to. Yeah. Right? You know that through your other training. Yeah. Right. And that is what it is. And that's a responsibility, right? You again, you have that um, you have that warrior way in you. Yeah. You know what it means at a deeper level than many people think. It's not just walking around with a gun. Right? It's about being as respectful for where you're at and the context of where you're at. And knowing the fact that short of someone coming at me with a gun, mm -hmm. that if a situation arises, I can oh, you peacefully, peacefully, but also assertively defend myself to the point of strength. Yeah. Yep. Where Master Silvio Baring is 66 years old, five foot six. And he can still yeah. own you. Yes. <laughs> and he, there was a situation where we were going through a demonstration and the guy asked him, what would I do in this situation? Or what would you do in this situation? And Master Baring's just like this, okay? He grabs me, pop the arm. Pop the arm and run. That's it, that's what he said he would do if I attacked him. And I only weigh him probably about 130 pounds. So that's a situation where a jujitsu master is saying, this is a situation. If necessary, yep. you do do what you have to do. Yep. But you understand the consequences and the responsibility to do that. Yep. All right, so we're going to carry on. Our last one is, like I say, 20 minutes. Uh, I know it's getting close to probably when most people are kind of like going, I've had enough and I want to go home. It's hard. You can feel free to go home, or we'll have some more conversations after this. But, uh, Something like that. Maybe we need to move here we go. forward. So it's finding a place Todd first called and said the theme was community. I started looking for the ways that community is used, and they're used a lot of different ways. The online community, business community, white community, black community, tech community. I even crowdsourced this question to my little cadre of social media followers, and I got all kinds of responses where people felt community. Festivals, football games, funerals, churches, and of course, it might not surprise you that if you look at this, it doesn't really have much of a meaning. It doesn't really tell us what we should be doing if we're trying to build a community. When I think about community, I think about Martin Luther King Jr. And I think about the notion that he put forward of a beloved community. 
He said, our goal is to create a beloved community, and this will require a qualitative change in our souls and a quantitative change in our lives. You see, the community that King envisioned is all-inclusive. Everybody's a part of it. It can't be exclusionary if it's beloved. Second, if it includes everyone, the differences of its members have to actually be embraced, the beloved part of the community. And then King talked a lot about, when he talked about beloved community, the fact that we all had to work for justice. And not only the justice of ourselves, but we had to work for the justice of every member of the beloved community. Now that is a pretty tall task, but I think it's a necessary one. And King thought it was a necessary one because what he said was that in an interconnected world, the only way we may develop the empathy required to actually solve our problems across our differences was by building the beloved community. So that's the challenge. How do we build the beloved community? Well, what if building the beloved community actually meant us taking one phrase and applying it to ourselves and to our actions, a phrase we've all heard many times, love thy neighbor. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, love thy neighbor, you don't know my neighbor. <laughs> or like my wife and I, our walls were so thin, we know our neighbor far too well. But I don't want us to think about a specific person when we think about love our neighbor. I think we want to look at the root of the word. So if we take this notion of neighbor, instead of thinking about the people who live near us, I want us to turn it around and think about the people who we live near, that we actually start to be a neighbor by living near someone else's home. So in other words, how do you love someone's home base? Well, you can visit their home base, you can visit their community, and I'm sure many of us have. If I went to your home, I'm sure I'd see travel photos and I'd see mementos, maybe artwork from other places, maybe other foods that you consume at home. But those visits are only visits. They are not the deep kind of engagement that we need when we think about beloved community because if we're gonna take this notion seriously, we have to confront a very tough truth. We cannot consume our way to community. One click, one more friend, one more trip is not actually going to build the beloved community. Instead, we need an engagement, an ongoing engagement with other communities and on their home turfs. There was a visit that I made when I was in college. Imagine a Sunday, sticky Sunday in September. I'm on the Marta bus going down to Old Ebenezer Baptist Church, King's Home Church on Auburn Avenue. And I go into the church, it was still in the original sanctuary then, and it was a sight, the original pulpit where King preached, the robes of the choir, the long pews, the women wearing their Sunday hats that you always see in an African-American church. And I sat down and the service started and we opened up our hymnals to the first song of the day and I was shocked to discover that the same song that was first that day on Ebenezer Baptist Docket was a song that we used to sing in my all-white country church in rural Arkansas. The second song, same one. Third song, same one. I knew all the songs. Now, I didn't sing them as well or as fast as Ebenezer Baptist. <laughs> but I knew them. And so I jumped right in and I sang them. And this caused a bit of a stir among my seatmates left and right, who I did not know, both African-American folks. They were curious why this 18-year-old kid knew all of these spirituals. So we started talking about it. We started talking about church. We started talking about family. We started talking about home. I went back the next Sunday, and then I went back again. And those visits turned into an engagement, which then turned into an academic pursuit, that then turned into a professional pursuit. And for me, a lifetime of understanding and studying and engaging Southern African American history and communities. That's more than a visit. That's actually being a neighbor. It's not only that we build community by being the neighbor, but I would argue that being a neighbor is the ultimate expression of love. And the reason is because if we truly love our neighbor, that connection can transform people and it can actually reconcile the fiercest of enemies. If you look at the history of the American Civil Rights Movement, all the leaders at some point said something along the following lines. We weren't just fighting for African-American freedom 
we were trying to liberate the oppressors from their mindset. And we were trying to liberate America from the plight of segregation. And no one, no one embodied this more than someone that I've gotten to know, Reverend C.T. Vivian. Reverend C.T. Vivian is a true American hero. He was one of the people who sat in in Nashville, he was drug out of uh, restaurants, spit upon. He was one of the Freedom Riders, where he was beaten in Alabama and Mississippi. He was on the bridge in Selma on Bloody Sunday. This is a picture of C.T. praying for Sheriff Jim Clark, who was the feared and some would say murderous sheriff of Selma. And I asked Reverend Vivian one day, I said, what were you thinking when you walked up every day and prayed for Sheriff Clark? And he said, I'd pray in the morning, then I'd go to Sheriff Clark, and he would yell at me. And the next day I'd pray, and then I'd go, and he'd arrest me. And one day he even broke his hand across my jaw when he punched me. And the next day I prayed again because I truly believed that the next day was the day we were going to be reconciled and that he was going to see the evil of his ways. That is stunning. And it is what we see in so many different contexts. Whether you look at Gandhi and the way he thought about the British, you look at Mandela and Tutu and the way they thought about the Afrikaners, they believed that they weren't just freeing themselves, but they were building a whole new society and they were going to reconcile with their neighbors who they were living near. And they were right. Each of those societies were changed because of the practice of loving thy neighbor. Now these people have risen to the world of almost being saintly. And so it begs the question, how do we actually build our own capacity to be a neighbor, to practice this notion of loving our neighbors? Well, I believe that actually it is a combination of a mindset, the notion of beloved community, the notion of loving thy neighbor, living near their home base, and a certain skill set, that there actually are a few attributes that you can develop over time. And I'd like to just take a minute to kind of run through them. First one of these, and probably most important, is a true respect for otherness. If you're going to actually venture out and visit someone's home base and be the only person who is different who's there, you have to actually truly respect the otherness. I've done a lot of cross-community work, and I've often been the only other in the room, the only, uh, Afri the only uh, white person, the only male, the only southerner, the only whatever. And I used to, when I first started this, I used to try to fit in. So, you know, maybe I'd dress a certain way, or maybe I'd change my, change my accent a little bit, or maybe I'd try to find an artist that I thought somebody would like, and I would make these false connections. But that was the ultimate disrespect of the people I was visiting. I had to maintain my authenticity to show the actual respect of the other. And that's the basis that we have to enter communities. We have to maintain ourselves so that we actually can, when, asked, when we ask a question, we can actually be asking it in truth. The second is as we venture out, we don't have the ability to listen in the regular way. Maybe we speak the language, but we don't know the shorthand. We don't know the cultural markers. We don't know the landscape. And so we have to develop the ability to listen with our hearts. A friend of mine who's a social worker tells a story that among grief counselors, it's well known that grief is often expressed in one's native tongue. No matter how long they've lived in another country, whatever they first grew up with is the tongue and the language that they express true grief with. And the best grief counselors don't ask them to translate. They simply listen emotionally, they listen with their hearts in order to see what that person is feeling and see what they need. We have to cultivate the same sense. We have to listen with our hearts so that we can actually engage people who are very different from us and situations that are very different from us. The third is we have to have authenticity but flexibility of behavior. I lived in India for a while, and one of my projects, I was a consultant, uh, I had a, a team, and it was all Indians, and the client was all Indians. And we had a kickoff lunch to start the project. It was a nice buffet spread of Indian food. There was the food, there were the plates, there were the napkins, there were the peppers, there were the spices, there was the bread, there was no silverware. So I sort of paused a minute, looked around the room to see how this was happening and I noticed that people were setting up their plate a certain way. They were using the bread to basically dip the food eat with their hands. So I did the same thing. I set my plate up the same way. I went and sat down. I started eating with my hands. Didn't say anything, no drama, nothing. Six months later, one of the team members 
from the client came up to me. He said, you know, we were very worried about you when this project started. I said, oh, really? Why? He said, because we didn't think you were going to be able to connect with us, being an American and everybody else on the team being Indian. And he said, something happened to change our mind. I said, what was it? He said, the first day you ate with your hands and you didn't say anything about it. You didn't make a big deal out of it. That ability to take a little bit of information and apply it in real time, that little bit of flexibility of behavior can build enormous connection with someone else, especially when you're new to a community. Another is that you have to have a tolerance for ambiguity. Now, rounded to the nearest thousand, how many times do you think that I've been asked, what is a white guy doing running the Center for Civil and Human Rights? <laughs> It's in the tens of thousands now. And when I first started with the job, a lot of people, uh, a lot of times I would react a bit defensively. I would say, well, where's this person coming from? But very quickly I noticed that 99% of the time that question was actually asked from the very least curiosity and most often it was a positive. So I would simply answer it and then it would open a conversation. Someone would say, here's my connection to the topic. Here's my family story. Here's what I think you should be doing. And it became a positive exchange. If we're open to the ambiguity that exists when we first enter another community, it will often open up a very intimate conversation quickly. But if we're defensive, if we shut it down, if we try to make it about us, we'll miss that opportunity. The final one that we have to cultivate is one that's very hard to do, and that's overcoming the fear of accidental offense. Now, let me just try to do my best and say, I absolve you of all guilt of accidental offense starting today. Because if you're going to venture out, if you're going to actually practice being a neighbor to different communities, you're going to accidentally offend. My favorite story comes from my own family. My wife's family is originally from India. My family is originally from Oklahoma. And before we were married, my father and I visited my fiance then's parents' house without my fiance. We arrived, we had pleasantries, we drank tea, and then we went to take, my father and I went to take our bags upstairs where we were going to sleep. My father grabbed his bag because he likes to show that he's still pretty spry as an older guy, and carried it up the stairs, and I grabbed mine and carried it up the stairs. This caused a very fluxed phone call from my mother-in-law-to-be to my fiance. And she said, what is Doug doing disrespecting his father? And my wife said, what do you mean? And she said, he didn't carry his father's bag up the stairs. Doesn't he know that that's what we do? Well, this opened up a very interesting and ultimately an amazing conversation about the differences in elders, respect, culture across our burgeoning family. Sometimes we have to venture out. We will uh, be a, we will accidentally offend, but if we're open to it, we will make the connections and we will overcome that very quickly. You know, when I think about this notion of a neighbor, something happened very early on that makes this whole topic extremely personal to me. I uh, said earlier that I was from a rural town in Arkansas. It was 1,200 people when I grew up there. It's now a thriving metropolis of 2,000 people. I mean, it's just grown exponentially. And when I grew up there, we used to have a joke that they, there were two minority families in town, the two Catholic families. Because there was no racial, ethnic, religious diversity really of any kind in my little town in Arkansas. And so in one way, it was an idyllic community. But in another way, it was not the beloved community because it wasn't all inclusive. It didn't allow everybody to be a part of it. So that's where I was from. And being from there, I also was a huge fan of Arkansas college football as almost anyone is there, the Roaring Razorbacks. And when my brother went to college there, he was older than I was, he befriended one of the football cheerleaders, a guy who lived on his hall, and he called up, he said, if you come to the football game, Arthur will be able to get you on the football field. Well, this was the greatest news that I've heard in my five years of life, that I would be able to get onto the football field. So we go to the University of Arkansas, and I meet Arthur, and he takes me on the football field, and he is an incredible guy. He is kind, he is one of those people who connects with kids, he explains to me everything about football. This is a picture of that meeting. I'm on the left. <laughs> Arthur was my hero. He was the greatest guy I'd ever met. So I convinced my parents and my brother to bring Arthur home to my little town to visit us. Well, the return trip didn't go as well. 
Uh, when Arthur moved around the community, things were said, people were a bit hostile. It was not a great reception. And Arthur's response to it was the same he had had to me. He was kind, he was loving, he was accepting, he was empathetic. He visited our home base in a way that was giving, even though people didn't want him to be there. And that moment set me on a path to do my very best to try to build that empathy within myself for various communities. It inspired me then, it continues to inspire me now. And it's something that I think is epitomized by a quote from someone who, of course, knows a lot about being a neighbor, <laughs> Fred Rogers. Fred Rogers said, love isn't a state of perfect caring. It's an active noun like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and now. That's exactly what Arthur did. When he visited our home, he accepted everyone he encountered, good, bad, or indifferent, exactly who they were right then and right there. This notion of love thy neighbor is something that, for me, transformed me very early in life. It's something that, as I have studied the American Civil Rights Movement and other social movements, it shows itself to have a transformative power on society and is the only way that enemies can be reconciled. And as we look across our community, as we look across our world, the problems strike me as being communal in nature. Whether it be the environment or economics and poverty or freedom and human rights, they're all communal. And I believe today that the only way we can build the capacity individually and collectively to address our communal problems is by pursuing the beloved community by loving our neighbors. I hope that we'll get started today. Thanks. All right, there you go. Uh, that's what I like about today, is that we are a community, regardless of who we are, regardless of our opinions, and whether others believe in us or not, or believe not believe in us, but believe the same things that we do. There will be commonalities, and we will ebb and flow within our own community as to what interests us at any given time and what we focus on and how we apply our skills, knowledge, experience, what have you. Uh, that what I'd like to see more of, and I have been seeing more of, is that this community thrives. Because I believe that we do have a commonality, more in common. All right, Kev. <laughs> Mr. K, come on up. All right, so, so Laura, thank you everyone for coming to this workshop. We're, we're not just finishing yet. I just haven't spoke yet today. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the event doesn't go until about 4.30 and we have to be gone by 4.45. So while we usually do leave some room for networking, there's a few couple points I want to go over. The number one is, Kevin, how do we make this loop game up, please? Uh, by taking the button and pressing the off, the red, no, the red button, on the, on the left, to your left, to your left, there, yep, oh, there we go, okay, so, um, community, with a community and all of us, in a sense, getting to work together, to know each other on a personal level, a lot of events I've gone to, and they're powerful events, at the end you feel amazing, and then you go home and you're like, I'm never gonna see any of those guys again, sort of thing, and until the next event, and then you talk to them. But being part of a community is not necessarily coming together to say you're part of a community, but to actually do it, and what does doing it actually look like, and it's meeting people on a personal level after the events. It's getting to know each other's of each other as well as their networks, their family, and understanding how we can meet each other's needs and work together. All of us, I can guarantee, can find at least one, if not two people in this room right now that either one of their services, we can do some sort of work together or find something that they might not have said that they can accomplish, but they actually can because, like for myself, uh, I never see myself as a copywriter. Being part of this group with um, Troy and Kevin R, 
they've been saying that based on how you're talking to people and stuff, that would be a natural fit for you. And they're wanting you to do, maybe to do more of that, but it's that thing where by getting to know people, you <clears throat> learn more skills than they're letting on and learn more about them. Like certain people, they have their public perception of what they do, and then they have what they really do. Um, some people do some stuff during the evenings or during the weekends, their own little personal hobbies. Hobbies are a huge part. Most people don't talk about them unless you really know them what those hobbies are. So by really getting to know each other after the workshops, that's how we can really get to know each other. And instead of coming out and meeting new people, now you're coming out and having a meetings talk for a huge group of friends who want to do a whole bunch of change for the better. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about is how we, to get together and to meet more individuals in a community, one of the huge things is just all of us, if people know any events happening out in the community in the next month, so the month of May, um, to kind of let everyone else know what's happening around them, um, whether that's your son has a soccer game or your wife has some sort of charity event or something like that. Um, three events I know of. One, the third and bird, I believe it is. It has an event, a vendor's market, and that is at Hudson's Bay on Portage. That's going to be happening in the next few weeks. Another one's the wine tasting at the RBC Convention Center. That seems like a really exciting event. And then the last Saturday of May, we're going to have another one of these bang events too. Does anyone else have any other community events they're thinking that's happening in May or things that they want to invite people down to? Um, actually, Fitness on the Go is going to be at Fitness Experience, kind of doing a booth, meet the trainers, get some advice on training if you want to start. Uh, also, too, like uh, get some expert advice on equipment if you want to actually start training at home. Do you know when that is? Uh, May 5th, actually, at 10 o'clock in the morning till about 3 or 4, I think. Okay, that's very exciting. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything? Well, there's a couple of concerts. I don't know if people would be interested in that. Um, because I'm part of a choir, and there's a whole bunch of people that I've met in other choirs. So there's one at, um, oh, on the 12th of May. I don't remember, the, I don't remember all so the details. You, yeah, could you post that? Or, or that no, yeah, there's three or four of them. You can I can't it. go to all of them, but they're very, very good. Uh, one of them is an acapella. Are they outdoors or in? Sorry, sorry. No, they're they're in, in churches. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, or, yeah. Uh, different churches? Are always the same one? Uh, different churches around town. Okay. Different. Uh, so. There's a coming in neighborhood near you. Oh well, yeah, there's one that's uh, a Santa Boy chorus that says that's that's interesting because they're uh, a cappella because they're sweet Avalon. It's like women that do barbershop. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's real interesting. Yeah. I went to one of their meetings yeah. and the. Uh, their voices are the instruments, so they uh, they have to be placed properly. It's really interesting how within they place the, like within things. the actual uh, group as well too. Yeah, yeah it's, so just, it's really neat yeah, the yeah, way yeah, they're, yeah. they're placed and the way they they line people up and figure out what the the progression of the voices are. It's awesome. Yeah. I, I don't want to do this because it's really hard work, but okay. <laughs> it's really really incredible. And uh, yeah, that, that's a good one. And another one is a gospel one, uh, I think at the Park Theater. And then uh, the other one is French, but they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> no, they sing English songs as well. Oh, love you, buddy. Thank you, that's a chat. Preet, is there anything at the Human Rights Museum? Uh, event? No. Okay, I heard something interesting. Is Wednesday's free? The first Wednesday of every month is free, and the other Wednesday it's uh, five dollar. But yeah. that's after uh, five p.m. I see now Facebook, and I'm like, now I got a reason to attend. Yeah. Well, I've been wanting to be for the longest time, but my wife's always working, so it's like, yeah, I'm having a good time. But I just see that I'm like the cheapness in me, I'm going. hours <laughs> <laughs> Of course. The what's it called, Toronto had Ripley's Aquarium. It's this huge aquarium, and it took me three hours to go through, photo, and view everything, and then... Kind of like Ikea with me. And then I, yeah, pretty much. And then I was looking for my friend who was in there, 
So then I walked around and it literally, it was about three minutes to walk through the entire thing. I'm just like, I stared at these fish as long as I thought. Or it felt much bigger, but then when you walk through the second time. Okay, um, Lisa, do you have another one of your art things coming up? Um, no, not presently. Um, I'm busy with other things. But CBC Radio also has um, a choir. I, a yeah. choir at 345 mm -hmm. on Friday. You go to the CBC building. I haven't been yet. But they do a different song every time, and they practice for like an hour and 45 minutes, something like that. Yeah. And they have a leader, and they do awesome stuff. Anyone can go, any age, any... A spontaneous choir. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really cool. cool. Wow. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. 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 Is there any other events anyone can think of? There's um, a really cool, I've, I've run to a few times, the Pirate Festival. The okay. Twin Swords. Twin Swords, it's cool. It's um, usually, I think it's the last weekend in May or the first weekend in June. Uh, and it's all, we, uh, they got great shows and people come totally decked out. It's really, it's fun. It's neat. Where is it? Um, it used to be at Coronation Park, but now it's on, um, there's an empty lot on Sargent. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I went last year um, when it was on Sargent, and it was really neat because you see all these people decked out in their pirate costumes. Speaking of which, so every two years, so this is, a, this is the year that it's happening, there's a medieval festival happening at Cook's Creek. Cool. Oh, wow. It is real hard to get tickets. You may not be able to get tickets, but they do it the all. The jousting and that medieval, yeah, uh, showboating, yeah, every two years. So if anybody's interested in that, just check it out. You can just do a search for Cooks Creek Medieval Festival, and I like the part. I, know the <laughs> I believe the last week of May also has the Penny Bears picnic too. Mm -hmm. That's coming up as well. Mm -hmm. Then anyone else? I'll post some stuff. Yeah. Everyone who did say their event, do post it in our community group so everyone else can see what's happening in their community. Uh, myself, I've been trying to post a lot of content, just trying to put stuff up there. But instead of me just talking to everyone, by getting everyone to join in and talk amongst the community and um, work together online, that's how we build this thing. And when new people join, and here's the thing, we might have a great community now, we might be happy with it, but for new people to join, what they first do is they research everything about it. And, and it's funny, whether or not it's reality, they'll watch the videos, or at least the first 30 seconds of each video. They'll look on our Facebook group and see the engagement. They'll go on the events and see how many people are going, how many people are interested, how many are invited, and so by, um, creating that engagement in that community, giving them stuff to interact with, that really motivates them to become part of this. Because there's a lot of events, let's say on meetup.com, where you have one or two hosts, and they're just pushing the same content over and over, and so people become numb to that. But when they see an actual thriving community, that's what they want to become part of. Just for, uh, just for clarity too, uh, the three of us, Troy, Kevin, and myself, we really do believe in it, first of all, in an inclusive community. We also believe in a transparent community. Now you might say, but, but Kevin R., how come he was so secretive about the posting for the event today? You know, that's Kevin just wanting to be Kevin to say, well, you don't have to, we're gonna tell you a little bit of what was, what's, is gonna go on, but not necessarily everything, so that it can be a surprise and maybe more enjoyable and, you know. And I, I have heard that some people aren't showing up because they don't know what it's about. But then there's a lot of people who find out what it's about and say, oh, it's not for me. So I think that what you'll see in this video is a lot of how the events will be going on. There will be engagement, there will be whatevers, right? There will be, talk about money and talk about businesses and business networking, but community building and blah, blah, blah. So it's everything, it's a mishmash. This is the St. Norbert market here of people, right? You know, and so that's, so if there's anything that you wanna know, please ask, we'll, we're happy to. Anybody who wants to get involved more than, oh, we welcome that, please. <laughs>
right? So that's part of why we want to know your skills is so everybody else could say, hey, can you help me figure out how to bake this cheesecake because mine keeps flopping? Or versus, you know, hey, uh, you know, uh, we need some help this time, whatever, right? Help, I mean, the community is about helping each other, so. And then going on about uh, the description of what Kevin R was saying was that, so every single time we hold a workshop, whatever that means, um, a workshop is we get someone from within our community, which would be any one of you to come up and talk about something you're passionate about for an hour and try and educate people. So whether that's creating digital marketing, Lisa did our actual very first workshop in this style with our and she's been to every single event yet. Art and mindfulness, it was really great. Watercolor. <laughs> it was awesome. And so by hearing what all of you have to offer, we definitely do want to get you guys up here and create something where it's give and receive sort of thing. We're all working together for a common goal. Uh, we keep getting tons of requests from people who uh, see our workshop stuff and they want to do a lesson, but then we're like, come on out. And they're like, no, I'm busy, I'm busy, but I'll host the next one. And it's like, like seriously, dozens of people a week ask me that. And I'm like, well, we want you to Say it to the camera, to say it to the camera. We at least want <laughs> you to come to one workshop. This isn't the, the same, event. watching it is not the same you have to be here, you miss some stuff. <laughs> Definitely. And so by actually coming down, by being a member of the community, you have to come and listen to someone else before you get the luxury of now presenting to everyone else. We, otherwise, people come here, they come once, they host something, and then they leave, they need to be part of the community. Um, so we're, what we're doing is uh, also another part of the workshop why we're keeping the workshops, a generic workshop, is that we've had some people like someone who was in finance who come and talk to everyone and do a workshop on finance. But then people online see, oh, this is finance, this is not for me, and they don't come. So they look at the entire event based on the workshop. When the entire event is, um, you come here at the beginning, you network, you meet new people. Uh, we do some networking games. We have a good time like that red and black game. And then we do a workshop just for an hour of the four hour session and to learn some new stuff from our members. And then towards the end, we talk about community events and we get to know each other. And then after, towards the end, the people who are here get to vote about the direction of where this group is headed, which brings us to the next part. Well, before the next part, <laughs> sorry, we're going to go into that voting section first, but once again, if any of you guys do want to host a workshop, we're looking to select someone for the last week of May. We got some people interested, but we told them you have to come in order to host that workshop. And so we want the people here now to be able to present their ideas and whether it's, for me, it's probably just a private message and that's good. Um, it could be a type of thing where we create a poll in the community and everyone post ideas and people vote based on what they want to hear and learn about. And so there's so much ways we can go about it. But we definitely want to do, uh, hear all your workshop ideas to see where we can go from there and book some in advance. Uh, so then to the voting part, uh, did anyone, or let's start off, what did people like or dislike about today's um, workshop. Does anyone have any opinions they want to vote on? You know what? That I, guy who needs to shave his hair so much. Who's that guy? Kevin's need to shave. I was recognizing it. It's been winter for a while. You know, I, I got the impression it was like a drop in. I don't know, maybe it was just written, or I didn't understand the way the, yeah. the post was written. That's why I came late. I thought, yeah. it's a drop in. And most are, a lot of workshops are just come in and network. And a lot of people said, well, we'll come in, we'll come in at 3.30 or 4.30. And sure, not everyone that can fit their work stuff, but at the same time, it's once people come here first, 
then they be able to understand the momentum so they know for the future events. At the same time, there's also videos. We have a video of all of our past workshops on uh, both Facebook and YouTube where people can watch those as well. And I, know, but I was kind of sorry because I wanted to, that sounded like an interesting thing, that black and white. Well, and I'll tell you this, and I, like, I would like some feedback as well too, here and later. Feel free to let me know how this worked. Like as some of you may have heard me say, this is just a tip of the iceberg of what I am hoping to present over the course of however long I have material to do this kind of stuff. And I absolutely am prepared to do the red black game again. Hopefully it will be with, well, and here's the thing, re-auditing the red black game doesn't make it any different, <laughs> right? No, because you could still be sitting in a group going, but this is what I want. And you're still gonna have the different people sitting across from you with a different day that they had today, and the cornflakes or the special K that you didn't have in the morning, <laughs> right? So, I got that. I um, for breakfast. <laughs> then, uh, but, but yeah, so feedback is great, excellent, and I'll, you know, we'll be doing some more of this stuff. Like, personally, I think this is like amazing, what you got going on, your ideas, what you're bringing to the table here, exposure, you know what I mean, like collective learning, like it's a really great like environment and this I think can grow very large and I think it's like probably going to be a very like large initiative that you're starting right now. Um, and this is just literally the tip like you said and the tip is very exciting at this point. I feel. Now with you feeling that motivated and positive about this, then it would be very influential for to hear, well, I love everything except this one small part. Mm -hmm. What would that part be if there was anything you didn't like about it? I, I legit loved everything. Except the cookies and the meat. <laughs> that's a personal I know. It's a good choice, right? Like, you can't force me to eat cookies. But like, you could try though. <laughs> <laughs> great. You've got, you got the jujitsu grappler over there right beside you. Yeah, but you know what's great? You still, even though there was cookies and you personally don't eat them, you still came. And I'm assuming it's more for the learning experience. He wanted to come for the cookies uh -huh. and he asked me. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> but the truth comes out. And he, that's, what he, that, that's what he led with. Yeah. And like, I, I literally had no idea what was happening. Like, no oh, idea, but like, <laughs> but I'm just so open to like being around anything. I just, and I feel so good in my physical body right now. So like, I was feeling very ill before. Yeah. So I just want to get out and see people and be in the community. Energize, you know, and just connect, yeah, and connect yeah. with people. Yeah, and like everybody, it, we're all very diverse, but yet at the same time, we unify, we unify together diverse, in a diverse way with same, like similar goals. We all have similar goals, right? So we all have something different to bring to the table, which is what's great about this group. Do you, have you ever baked cookies for yourself in a way you felt was healthy? Um, no. Ah, I like, don't really If think so, I want to see your recipe. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, like, it's a learning experience. There are tons. Yeah, there's a lot of different, you know what, I could try and make some for next time. Here's a uh, question. For sure. What do you consider a treat, a dessert? What do I consider? Yes. A dessert. Like a small piece of chocolate. Like small, Whoa. like very bite-sized. Okay, so everybody, go find out how to be a chocolatier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have much of a sweet tooth, so. Right. And that's fine, but you may find something else treat. I would. Connecting with people is a very treat. Like it's a very big treat for Aww. me. So <laughs> this is enough for me. I can be sustained on this connection. I know that there was about 
two to three people who message me. I message like 300 people personally telling them to come. And two or three of them said, I'm not coming to this event solely because I'm allergic to like gluten or these things. And I said, that's perfect. That's why we need you here. We need you to send us your recipes, help create mindfulness, educate people on other people. It's that whole thing, like people- There is gluten-free brownies here, right? Lisa! Yeah. 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 Thank you for the you. And like, same with people who, let's say, have a wheelchair handicap or something. Yeah. We need you to come here to help uh, educate us based on that. As part of the community, and a lot of us as business owners, there's a lot of business owners where accessibility just doesn't pass their mind, which is why the disability community right now is booming in business owners. Lots of successful business owners are educating as well as innovating and inventing new and unique gadgets for people with disabilities. Yeah, what's even worse from my perspective is that um, organizations and buildings out there say that they're accessible, but they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Accessible when they're broken down the elevator. We get there then. Yeah. Man, I would, yeah. That's very true. Yeah. The way they're built, the construction too. Yeah. yeah. I was a, I was a big time like advocate for people with physical and intellectual disabilities for a very long time. And I come from a place where in the future I might have those types of disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much attuned to like what's going on around me and observant. So mm -hmm. I'm a huge advocate. Speaking of observing, before you guys run off yet, I want to focus all of the eyeballs on the two people who came in. Mm -hmm. Tell Stacey. us your name and tell us about yourself. What do you do? I'm Stacy. I'm a student at U of M right now. And what do you, what you do study? on your off time of being a student? Um, I have, I'm just about done my job at the community theater in St. Patel. And I work with uh, a neighbor as well. Dogs. Sometimes with your dad. Yeah, sometimes with my dad. <laughs> and? And I'm Darcy Barrington. Um, I own Air Surf Heating and Air Conditioning. Uh, I had some customers during the day and stuff that I had to take care of. I've known a couple of people here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I had no idea what's going on here. <laughs> But I knew there was cookies, Thanks. so I don't know like them, so I had your share too. <laughs> um, yeah. any, did anyone else have any feedback that they want to share? Anything they would change with today's event? Just an agenda would be nice. I think that would solve some problems. Just to have an agenda of like, you know, you know even if you're, if it's just a game. Cool stuff happening shop. here. Yeah. Network case. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I didn't share. I just didn't share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I think that would allow people to know when you want to show up. When to show up. Okay. Or, 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 if that's yeah. what they can yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because Dawn, for example, had to leave early yeah. or whatever. Right. Yeah. You know, and some, yeah. we just can't fit everybody in, but at least they can come for parts of it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I also made that like, case of like having a whole three and a half hour event where you, you can have shorter breaks, but like, you know, That. And, and, and like, here's the thing. We, we did take an extra hour. <laughs> yeah, we we um, because it was happening every week. We were finding some people couldn't come during the week, right? And so then we figured we'd do it in the weekend. But we know not everybody can come in the weekend either. You know, uh, maybe they're especially coming into the summer. They're all out at the lake or whatever, right? So I myself would like to see both. I'd like to see a weekend event and a weekday event at least once per. But here's the thing. We need volunteers. There's Kevin, there's Kevin, there's Troy. And we're all living busy. Troy? Golden Ball. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, we're uh, you know, we're doing our best to, to accommodate as, as we can, you know, but more more help the better, right? The the way it can works is it's not oh I, we're the tell leaders us how. we are going to make you guys do it in this way the way a community works is you guys find the next one but yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Whoever comes with it comes with it. And so we, we need you guys to participate and give your feedback and give your voice. And so just simply by saying the word, I'm interested in helping the next event, even if it's yeah. just um, hearing what you guys are saying, giving my random word of advice every now and then. We that mean, not even a joke. You know, mm -hmm. fairness. You guys, like any one of you or any one of you out there in the internet land, uh, like seriously, you want to do your own? Like you, you think that you we should be doing something? Set it up. Tell us, we'll help you. You know, I mean, part of being a leader is being a servant, right? We serve. Leaders the real serve. leader is that second person that comes in. Yeah. And so, I, if you got something and you say, hey, I got time to put into this, you know, tell us, and we'll. I mean, that's what the community is for. Tell everybody. I, like, one of the things I was going to throw in here, too, is intention. This is an intentional community, right? And I want to know your intentions. Mm -hmm. What would you like to see? Is it a, 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 a tomato plants in front of City Hall? Is it, you know, some guerrilla gardening? Is it, uh, let's go help, um, you know, a North End uh, group or, or whatever? Uh, it's, it's how we can actually go to the community and make yeah. difference. You know, I think it's great intention individual. that you guys went individually or collectively, and for those of us who have the opportunity and motivation or intention to support our fellow community members, absolutely. Go together and know. support the local choirs or the local yeah. markets or what have you. Yeah. And each other. And each other. That's key, right? You know, they say blood is thicker than water. Pretty much every community that I know of, there there is as much of a blood connection as anything else. You know, we are a family, and hey, that's pretty cool. So, message me if you want to have a voice. Simple as that. Other than that, um, there is still time for networking. Technically, the library doesn't close till five. Um, I'm going to start packing up just because. Every single time we've got this library, we've gone 15 minutes past closing, <laughs> and they hate us now. <laughs> but other than that, you can still hang out here and network and talk, or there's quiet spaces everywhere. What I really recommend is try and get at least two other people you have not met before today, and find a time in each other's schedule in the next month to sit down and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations to really get to know. Point the people to our videos. <laughs> Two. Yeah. That's it. Just a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So sit down one-on-one, -on -one, really get to know each other. You don't have to utilize a service. I might not need digital design directly. I might not need art and mindfulness directly. But by knowing each other and really understanding each other, Maybe down the road, there's someone I know who really could use Lisa's art and mindfulness. Maybe there's someone I know that could really use that digital marketing and personal training, all that stuff. And so by sitting down, it might not help you, but that's not the community. It's how we can help others in the community.